All right. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, let's all remember that time that Kathy said, let's kick 2020 <laughs> in the teeth. Uh, although, amen. <laughs> yes. Uh, delighted to have everybody gathered here today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, wherever you are at, we're really glad that you chose to be a part of our community this morning. Um, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Christian Limbeck. I'm a very grateful lead pastor at Hillcrest Church, and you're joining us, as is probably evident by now, uh, on the first Sunday of Advent. Now, we're excited to get this uh, series started, although I've had to keep reminding myself, it is November 29th, and we're starting Advent like Christmas is on its way. Um, Advent is a Latin word, Adventus, and it means essentially to arrive. However, uh, in the Roman world at the time these books were written, this word Advent had a very distinct meaning. And it seems pretty clear when you start to unpack it that our New Testament authors have co-opted this word Adventus and its really distinct meaning to help illustrate uh, what is going on with Jesus and to help kind of draw these new Christian uh, followers, Jesus followers, into understanding. Uh, when a Roman emperor would return, arrive at a city, it was known as his advent, his adventus. In fact, here is a coin uh, that was minted in 250. This is a coin that commemorates Trajan returning, like a return arrival to Rome, his advent. Um, a key idea was that here's how an advent worked, that especially at a time of tragedy, um, a Caesar, and this emperor would visit a city, uh, surmise its ruin, come into the ruin, and then leave a large deposit of his own money to see it restored, and then he would leave, and the people of the city uh, knew that they were to keep a constant alert for his adventists, his sure return arrival. Well, like I said, New Testament writers grab hold of this word and its understanding to bring believers into a similar context, help them understand what's going on with Jesus. The king has come into the ruin and made a way for restoration. He has left his own deposit to see it done, and he will assuredly return to see it finished. Now, like any of these kind of pickups that they do, you can't unpack every layer of this illustration, but all Christians have to admit this is a powerful word and a powerful Roman idea to help understand the space that we are in. Jesus came into his own creation in human flesh, and by his life, his teaching, his conduct, his miracles, and especially his resurrection, established what was true. He made a way of restoration, and he left the deposit of the Holy Spirit and his church and gave us an assurance of his return when he will see it completed. And this is where we live. This is what we celebrate in Advent, that we live in between arrivals, actively participating his restoration while eagerly awaiting his return. Advent. Over the next few weeks, we will be unpacking this Adventus, this life in between, kind of living together. What are the lessons that are best learned in waiting? And what power is there in actively living this future reality by anticipatory participation right now as we work alongside Jesus in his kingdom work. Um, our first text today for Advent is John chapter 1. Now we're going to begin in verses 
1 through 8, but carry it to verse 14 and 18. Um, If you're taking notes, I really want to encourage you to also add to this John chapter 12, verses 20 through 50, and 1 John, the first three chapters, which is almost the entire book. Um, This is a good opportunity for me to mention that if you look below, you'll see a section marked notes. And in notes, we put all the scriptures that we're teaching and even some of the scriptures that we referenced when we were preparing the lesson. Uh, So if you want to begin making your way to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, as we've said, there's an index in the front of your Bible if you need help finding that book. And John is kind of way right in your Bible. Um, As we begin today, uh, I want to encourage us to use our imagination. (laughs) Uh, In the next few moments, you may even close your eyes. Uh, Last week, Tim talked to us about the dark island from the voyage of the Dawn Treader. Today, what I'd like to do is imagine that there is such a place, but this time, let's make it a vast place underground city. Let's imagine that sometime, sometime way in the past, thousands of years in the past, a whole city of people was driven underground. And somewhere early in the history of these people who live underground, a tragedy struck. And they lost all of their light and all of their ways out. And both time and darkness have obscured the truth They live in a world where things are absolutely pitch black. This is the only world that they know. They have always lived in this one underground world in the complete dark. What kind of world view would they have created? Are you able to imagine that? Everything underground is only what they can touch, what they can hear, and what they can taste. In fact, their eyes, as they can feel them softly placed in the front of the head, their their very purpose would be a mystery, wouldn't they? They've never seen depth nor color, never had any understanding of what Their eyes are four. Um, I want you to imagine the tales that they would create, the folklore, the ideas, their understanding of what the world is. Now, history of isolated community tells us that these folks would still create a complete worldview with ideas about their origins, their purpose, what reality is, what death means, the afterlife, God, etc. They would formulate all these ideas, but can you imagine how far they would be from the truth? How far from the world that is? They've never seen color, no sense of being above the ground. There are no stars, no universe, no cosmology. There are no other people, just this closed world in the dark. Now, I want you to further imagine that one day an authority comes from above ground. He enters into the public square and he turns on a light. And he tells them about the vast, greater reality of everything. How would they react? How would they respond? Well, history shows us again that some would reject and retreat away from this news. Uh, They would go find a dark corner of the city where they could pretend the light did not exist because it would be too much information. They just could not shift their understanding to this truth. History tells us that others would be curious. They might be willing to believe this incredulous information from this authoritative visitor, but not enough to follow him out. Curious, but not enough faith to follow out. It also tells us that some, once the light is turned on, would believe. And with maybe trembling faith, could follow this authority out and find a world of truth beyond their imagination. 
I'd love for you to let that image sit for a moment. Just play with that idea in your mind, this vast subterranean city. I know it's vastly oversimplified towards the truth, but it gets even more interesting if we add even just the slightest biblical connotations. Imagine that the visitor is the timeless architect of this city. Imagine that he enters into their lives and takes on the risk to become the way out, that he says, I must leave to prepare, but I will return and take you out. Imagine in this story that there is an ancient enemy that desires to keep the people of the city in the dark. I mean, even if we just add those tiny little story ideas, those twists and turns, it gets more compelling. Well, today's passage actually, and again, I, I don't, don't overwhelm this, but it plays with some of these same ideas, paints a similar picture. Jesus entered into humanity's dark understanding and turns on the light. There may have been shadowed understandings story, small revelation, but it is Jesus who comes in and turns on the light. He repels the enemy and the lies. This truth, when Jesus enters in the world, he brings a truth that upends the universe and irrevocably answers these fundamental questions, who we are, how we got here. And what life is for. Once Jesus enters into the story and turns on the light, there is no going back. Truth must be reconciled. Jesus says in John 12, 46, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in the darkness. Let's read today John chapter 1 about the coming of the light. If you're with me in John 1, beginning in verse 1, you're going to find me stopping a few times that it says, in the beginning, stop. These three most familiar words of Scripture. We've said so many times before that John elicits these words with intention to draw you back to the first words of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning places this authority, truth teller, before creation. Whoever we're getting ready to talk about in here, they were in the beginning. Only God is in the the beginning. It says, in the beginning was the word. This Greek word is logos. In the beginning was the word, the ha logos. Now, logos is both a Hebrew and a Greek idea. John is intentionally grabbing a highly loaded word. In Hebrew concepts, the word of God is active. It accomplishes his work. You may recall in the beginning, God said, let there be light. And there was light. God's very speaking of it makes it true. The scripture says, God cannot lie because the minute he says it, it's what's true. If God says it, it is what is true. God's word is power, authoritative power. But John is also borrowing this Greek idea. John's audience would have understand Logos also as wisdom, personified even, and capital T, truth. In fact, I pulled a definition from the PBS website, just so you would know I wasn't reaching into the coffers of great Christian wisdom. The Logos is the divine, universal divine reason Imminent in nature, yet transcending all oppositions and imperfections in the cosmos and humanity. An eternal and unchanging truth present from the time of creation available to every individual who seeks it. Halogos, the active word 
of God. This authoritative truth-telling visitor that we're going to read about in John 1 was before creation, and he is the truth, capital T, truth. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God ready, and the Word was God. Now, I have to, I have to tell you that John 1 is already this staggeringly beautiful book. He says so much in just a few words. The little he says shakes the foundation of what is real, but it all gets condensed into those five words. It gets exploded in verse 14 when it says, and the word becomes flesh, but it says, and the word was God. Now, I'll post in our online community group some of the Greek gymnastics that John goes through in this, and the word was God. But let me just say it is a predicate nominative, if you're interested, that with the precise use of the definite article and word placement says this very thing. This word that I'm talking about, this word is God, but not God the Father. And like I said, I'll post more about that. The word is God, but not God the Father. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You see, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came to witness testifying that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Verse 11, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. The authoritative truth teller is also sometimes rejected. The truth is too much. You know, to this day, sometimes we're surprised that people do not see and do not believe in Jesus. I just want to tell you that Scripture is full of people who walked with him. Judas knew him and lived alongside him and still did not believe. People in his own city knew him and did not believe. Proximity does not equal faith. Some will still reject him. Listen to what it says next. Verse 12, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision, nor of a husband's will, but born of God. For those who trust and follow, they are brought into a new reality that is so far above their current understanding that even as you try to explain it to them in the dark, it is unexplainable. Jesus says himself, I will take you into realities unimaginable. Imagine our city again. Imagine a citizen there who has never seen space in front of them or color or a horizon. Now try to explain a sunset. How about a sunset with the moon rising? It's true. It's just too fantastic to describe if you do not have that capacity. To say we will become children of God is true. It's just too fantastic to actually understand all that that means. This Word, this truth teller, comes to reveal this fantastically larger truth for us. Verse 14 says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. The great picture of Eden, of the tabernacle, the point of the temple and the hope of the future creation is that God will dwell among his people. 
This word means to set tent, to dwell, to be with his people. Jesus came and made a home among us for a time. He left his deposit of the Spirit and his church for restoration, and he will absolutely return. Adventus. Verse 18 says, jump down with me. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father. Now, verse 18 is one of those tricky places in Scripture. You may even see in your notes that there are other ways to translate it. And I won't get into it today, but suffice it to say, it says this. The light of the world, the Word of God, took on flesh, dwelt among us, and that Word is God in relationship with God the Father. And no other bit of news has ever changed the world more. Light has entered into the world and changed everything. And I, I don't know what to say, but to think about this subterranean city, there's no going back. You can deny it. You can hide away from it. You can run away with it. You can flirt with it. But here's the truth. Light has entered the world, and that, that is what is. And it has fundamentally changed our answers. Who are we? We are cherished creations, individually made by an intimately involved creator. Eternal beings made for a restored life. That's who we are. How did we get here? The same God who made everything placed us here. Which means it's wonderful intent Each day of this life, even when its heart is precious and worth living, and not one second of it will be wasted, not one minute of it is a mistake, life is not chaos. Life is a gift. Well, what is life for? It is to know and be known by God through the way made by His divine Son, Jesus, to be filled with His Holy Spirit and restored to abundant an eternal life, to invest this deposit in his work, learning to participate in the family trade of restoration until he returns. Adventus. The world of competition and consumption has been replaced by a worldview of truth, love, joy, and peace until God heals and restores this world forever. And there's great things for us to learn in the midst of this waiting. Having established the love and the authority of the truth teller, the light who has entered into the world, it is no mistake that we are in the advent. This is planned Adventus. We are participating in his work. We may ask ourselves these two really important questions this week. What is to be learned in the in-between, in the waiting? This week and the weeks to come, we'll ask ourselves this question. If Jesus entered in the world and established what is true, then what does this mean about like my deep existential anxiety at times, my sense of failure or lack of of worth, what about when I feel like I just can't? I can't, I can't family, I can't, I can't work. I, I didn't make it or do the thing that I thought. What, when life feels like a mess, this truth enters in and establishes an entirely different story. We learn immense gifted truths in the in-between, in the waiting. God, in great love, put us in the in-between. One day, I just, I just believe with all my heart we will look back and thank Jesus for each and every moment of this life, and especially the hard ones where we learn to walk with him and trust him, believe in him until he returned. The second question I would ask is, how do we actively participate in his return by participating in his rest and his community and his work right now. What is our work? What is our responsibility? What is our hope? What is the way we actually accomplish this? If 
He has come in truth, left us in this moment in truth, and is returning absolutely. It reframes the way we think about participating in his work. His advent, this in-between, is his gift to us. I hope that we will enter into this Advent season together, established in the absolute truth that the light truth of life has entered into the world and reframed our conversation, our understanding in our life, and he is drawing us into an eternal future that is grander and greater than we could ever hope to imagine. That this season you will with anticipation draw near to the King of Advent. Would you join me in this prayer? Lord Jesus, thank you. Uh, thank you for entering into this incomplete truth that you represent as darkness, even though there had been revelations of who the, who the Father was and how God interacted in the world. We only came to really understand who is who's God? How do we relate to God? Who are we? What are we doing here? What's life is for? You answered those questions. We read your words, your understanding. We notice your way. We follow in your footsteps, and you answer this question for us, which means we can enter into the in-between with peace, even anticipation, as we learn to trust and as we keep an eye out in anticipatory hope for your sure return, your advent. In your name, amen.